Hello, I'm V.V. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with Summer Little, who is director of UNM's uh, Women's Resource Center and the chair of something called UNM SART Program, which is a sexual assault uh, response team program. She's also a member of UNM's New Sexual Violence Task Force. She's here to talk with us today about what's really um, has been and is an epidemic of sexual assault and sexual violence and coercion uh, on American campuses uh, for as long as any of us can remember. It's uh, bad boy behavior. Boys should not be boys in this way, in my judgment. Um, boys should be gentlemen. Um, and so we're going to try and talk a little bit about the, the acculturation of males in America as well as explain these very important and I think very, very progressive and very expansive uh, views that the University of Mexico is taking about this shocking and terrible problem. So it's wonderful to have you here today. Thank you, VB. It's a pleasure to be here. We read that uh, that uh, sexual assault on campus at UNM has gone up quite a bit, or at least reporting on it in the last year from 4 to 11, I believe, I believe the number was just a big shocker. But of course, we know that what, about 80% of sexual assaults are not reported. 90. 90% now. Wow, that's incredible. So c could I ask you a little bit about SART? Well, no, first, let me ask you about the, uh, the sexual violence uh, task force and what's, what's that composed of and how that, how that came about and its relationship to, to uh, President Obama's White House task force on sexual violence. So really, the efforts around sexual violence prevention um, and response started on our campus right after the Dear Colleague letter came out from the Office of Civil Rights in 2011. Uh, there were a small group of us through the Title IX committee uh, who were meeting to discuss, go through that letter very carefully, um, and started to look at our policies and what we were doing um, around sexual violence prevention and response. Um, it was a small group of us, uh, and we were sort of limited with, with what we could do um, and how far we could go. And then if we go forward to 2013, there were some incidences that made the, the press. There were two attacks on our campus, um, which were termed groping attacks, which I think is not a, a great term to use, no. but... Yeah. is actually the, the, the criminal term for yeah. it. Um, and that really sort of hit home, I think, for a lot of us on campus that we really needed to focus. Um, and the president instructed the then chief of police, Kathy Guimau, uh, to establish a sexual assault response team. And so she brought me on as, as the co-chair, uh, and we worked from May to August, uh, which is lightning, uh, fast right. um, to get our partners in place, the protocols in place and the procedures um, and all of those things. And, and we did start work uh, in August. Um, so then through this past year, we had a lot more things happen around uh, with the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, the new requirements under the Jean Cleary Act that is part of VAWA, um, and the Campus Save uh, legislation that is all sort of in that package of, of the Violence Against Women Act. So there were new requirements coming down from the federal government, um, and we were using those to guide uh, what what our conversations were. So addressing our policies, looking at our response, making sure that SART was running the way it needed to run, um, and that we were reaching out as much as we could um, to the campus community to let people know to where to go to report. Because um, quite often, you know, something happens and then you just don't know. Yeah. And it's a traumatic thing. And, of course, it's terrible. And yeah. um, so then the White House had their task force and issued their report, not alone. Um, so we've been using that. Each each time something else comes out, we add it to the, the pot, right? Yeah. Um, and we look at it for best practices and guidance. And we're still awaiting the final guidelines um, from the new Campus Save Act. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a rules negotiating committee uh, that has been working um, 
on that for, gosh, I think a year. Uh, and we should be getting those final guidelines in November. And so all of the new requirements have to be in place by July 2015. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're still coming up on some pretty hard deadlines yeah. from the government in terms of compliance. Mm -hmm. But it also empowers those of us who have been working on campuses across the country to reduce sexual violence. It empowers us and, you know, gives us the ability to say, hey, we do really need to be doing this work. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now it's time to give us some resources. Right. You better do it fast. <laughs> exactly. And let's get it going yeah. because, yeah, the government's not playing around on this anymore. Um, and, you know, there there is some pending um, legislation from Senator McCaskill that could uh, increase um you know, the fines that universities might have to pay. Yeah. That's not, uh, I think she pulled it and she's going to reintroduce it with some changes. Okay. Um, but yes, the, the government is, is taking it seriously and it's very nice that it's being taken seriously in such a public way yes. because we need this issue to be public. It's a public health problem. Absolutely. It's a public problem. It's a pandemic not just on college campuses, not just in the United States, worldwide, one in three women will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. God. That's over a billion people. God help us. Horrible, horrible. Before we started, uh, we started, we talked a little bit about the c composition of UNM Sexual Violence Task Force, and you were commenting about how, what a broad net it was. And I wonder if you could explain that a little bit to us. Sure. And then we'll get into SART. So the task force um, was uh, charged by the president with our dean of students, uh, Tomas Aguirre, as its chair, uh, to pull a broad range of people together from across campus to figure out what our next steps were as an institution. Um, look at the problem, see where we are, and, and what we need to do going forward. So we have representation from athletics, from the faculty, from staff, from student affairs. Um, we have students on that task force. There are almost 30 of us um, working together to address the problem. The police, um, our deputy chief sits on that task force. Um, our, the UNM communications uh, and marketing sits on the task force. Residence life, Greek life. Um, so we really have a huge pool of talent. Um, and people who can get stuff done um, in that room and on that on that task force. So what we did in the beginning was we laid out kind of our plan. We need to assess what UNM is doing uh, currently around sexual violence um, prevention and response. We need to make sure all of those things are aligned uh, with the requirements of what we need to be teaching or doing or, or whatever. And then once we identify the gaps, develop things to fill them, right? So that's been our work this summer. There's there's more to come, but that's sort of where we are. So when we looked at what was happening, we could see that there was some training for our students happening in certain places. Um, so what we did was, you know, we tried to get all those trainings together and then align them and then we being the women's resource center as part of part of this effort uh took over really the training of um uh athletics we've trained every single athlete at unm no since kidding. no kidding um they've had at least an intro session on sexual violence prevention we've trained every greek Great. member um wow. yes yes Good for you. yes we've been very busy um we've trained um the new student orientation leaders who then turned around and trained all of the incoming students all of our incoming first year students um and we're you know we've been doing training just yesterday i had the opportunity to train all of the staff student staff and professional staff in the student union building um so you know now individual departments and teams and and things like that are inviting us in to get this training um and it's really that part is so exciting because we get to have really interesting conversations um with everybody across campus but it's also very exciting to me that there was such a um 
a, a desire for this training wow. because people are calling and say, hey, come train us. Yeah. Hey, we want to hear this. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's amazing. The rugby team called and they're like, hey, come train really? us. Really? Wow. <laughs> yes. Wow. And um, they actually co-sponsored an event just the past weekend, Step Up and Walk for Women, um, to raise awareness around domestic violence. So we have so much happening um, that is really, really positive. Could you give us an idea of what, the, of what this training consists of? The training consists of... Um, laying the groundwork uh, with definitions. What is sexual violence? What does the continuum of sexual violence look like? Oh. So we take um, students through the continuum from you know unwanted jokes, gestures, what street harassment, right? right. Cat calling, right. Um, that kind of thing, all the way through the continuum um, to rape, sexual assaults, and physical violence. And so we try to, you know, help them understand that there is a lot to sexual violence. It's not just rape, yes. right? Um, there's there's coercion and intimidation. Um, there's exploitation. Uh, there's there's many different levels. So we take them through that, so they have some language Good. to uh, talk about, you know, the issues. Then we talk about the concept of healthy relationships, healthy sexuality, um, and consent. What we are talking about is enthusiastic consent, yes. right? We are, um, we are going to be an affirmative consent campus. Um, our new policy hasn't been approved yet, but that's the language that's no. that's in there. No. Um, we're looking for affirmative consent that's voluntary, sober, mutual, right? Cool. So we're talking to students um, about talking. <laughs> we're talking to students about talking um, and talking with their partners, whether it be a long-term partner, a hookup, whatever, yeah. whatever, their friends, whatever. Um, but consent is really talking and coming to an agreement about what we want to do in this interaction, how far each of us wants to go, knowing that that could change any moment. We, you know, both people are free to change their minds, yes. um, and really how to respect that. So at its very core, we're talking to students about how to have respectful, healthy relationships. We do it you know, in a lot of different ways. Um, but we spend time on consent. Um, and then we also talk about rape culture and what that looks like in our society. Because sex sells stuff. I don't think that's, you know, news to no, anybody. No, no. Um, but again, so we have this huge conversation about sex and these ideas about sex in our culture and, and what it's all supposed to look like and, and what it's all supposed to be. But nobody trains us in, on how to have that relationship, right. like that real relationship in our lives yeah. we're, we're just like you know flung out there and <laughs> we figure it out by trial and error yeah. right yeah. so this dichotomy is really set up that you know our our young people everybody really our young people have this idea and and it doesn't translate in a healthy way because this idea this cultural story about sex is really um um really rife with with rape culture and so what i mean by that are you know the language we use the uh, laws media traditions and they can come from church or other inst institutions um that really normalize violence against women they do indeed they God. make it normal Misogyny never goes away. Right, right. And this is thousands and thousands of years of, of programming um, and, and reality, right? I mean, when we look at history, it's just not that long ago that women were property. Yeah. So I think, you know, we've come so far, but entrenched in a lot of aspects of of. The, the overall culture and certainly parts of individual cultures uh, that come together um, really support the notion that women are not equal, that women are not yet fully human and have full human rights. Self-determination over our bodies, 
to be able to say no, yeah. right? Yeah. To make those decisions. Um, so we have we still have a lot of work to do. What's really exciting to me is the the numbers of men who are starting to be involved in this work. Good. Good. As Good. allies um, and as scholars and you know as excuse me as um, as public figures to say hey let's look at this. Right. In conjunction with all the women who have been doing all this work for a long, long time. So we look at rape culture and we show some examples of rape culture, some advertisements. And so we have a little discussion about what that looks like. Um, And I tell them about a study that was just recently done in the Journal of um, Gender. And I can provide you that that uh, citation that really the way that young women frame sexual abuse and sexual violence that happens in their lives is actually that it's normal and to be expected. Jesus. Like they're just going to experience it as a girl, as a, as a female. And so I think, you know, we have, again, we have so much to do around this issue. So we talked to the students about rape culture, um, consent, healthy relationships, the definitions of sexual violence, and then we start turning the conversation to what we can do together, all of us. So we can be what's called active bystanders, right, or upstanders, or, you know, there, there are a few different terms. But so a bystander is somebody who's close by, who's seeing something that's happening, but isn't directly involved. So that person has a decision to make right after seeing what's going on they can act or not act we want them to act we want them to act in a safe and positive way that doesn't endanger them that doesn't further violence we're not advocating for you know rushing in and beating somebody (laughs) up um we want you know words to be used so we talk to them about examples of of um different ways they could intervene in different situations like if it's a joke um, what can you say, right, that yeah. would feel okay? Yeah, yeah. If it's an instance where they see violence, what would be an appropriate response? Um, what can they do? And sometimes that is leaving and calling the police. Yes, yes, yes. And that's okay. Yes. That is important. And so we want to make sure they understand whether they're directly confronting somebody and saying, hey, that is not cool and you need to knock it off, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, or they're stepping away and calling the police or they're saying they're going up to somebody and saying at a party, say, this is a situation that we use. You're at a party. You see somebody hitting on somebody else who is clearly intoxicated. They're trying to get them to go like into a, a, another room and you just think it's not right. Right. What can you do? So one thing is you can go up and say, hey, is that your car? It's getting towed. (laughs) It's just a distraction. Right. There's no real danger because then that person can say, hey, well, that's not my car. But there's that 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 opportunity, that moment to maybe get to that person um, and help them away or at least break the concentration of, of the per- person who is intending them harm. So we talked to them about so many different levels and ways for them to intervene, uh, but really encourage them to do that. Um, and then uh, we go into what happens if you experience sexual violence, um, where to go, um, try not to blame yourself, <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we do talk about victim blaming quite a lot because that is a huge part, which, of course, is how rape culture is perpetuated Mm -hmm. and sustained. Mm -hmm. Right. We have conversations about victims and what was she wearing? Stereotypically, Mm -hmm. I I, I generally talk in terms of, you know, a a female victim and a male perpetrator because statistically that's the predominant. Mm -hmm. Right. But but sexual violence happens in all relationships um it can happen between men um it happens in same sex couples um it happens everywhere and we need to be talking about all of it and it, and indeed women can also rape men right we need to be talking about all of this but when i'm presenting i do use that 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 um that setup so we talk about um you know what was she wearing why was she there 
Was she drinking? Had she had sex with him before? You know, what's their relationship? As if any of that matters. As if any of that matters. Because clearly, when we think about it rationally, we know that even if you're running down Central naked as the day you were born and completely inebriated... Rape is not the punishment for that. <laughs> Maybe an overnight at the detention center to sober up in a charge of, I don't know, disorderly conduct or something. But rape is not the punishment. You don't, you, you cannot do anything. Any of us, you can't do anything that should result in rape being the punishment. Yeah. So we, you know, we have these conversations with our student students, and it's really interesting to see them process, um, you know, go through the the initial feelings of, oh, this is all, all anti male, right? And then start to, to understand, even in that in that moment, we can't change all of this with one session. <laughs> Right. Prevention. As we said, this is thousands of years of of um, enculturation. Um, But we are starting these conversations and we're making sure that they know that there are resources to help them so that they understand how to report on campus and what that means. If they because of um, the Cleary Act. Hmm. Sure. So the Cleary Act is about how campuses report crime that happens on campus. Okay. So many of us are, well, basically all of us are mandated reporters. So people who are accepted from that are um, counselors, healthcare providers, and advocates such as myself. So what I mean by mandated reporters is if somebody discloses to somebody at the university, a staff or a faculty, that they have experienced sexual violence, that staff or faculty is mandated to pass that information along to both the Office of Equal Opportunity and also to um, our Deputy Chief of Police, Christine Chester, because she is our interim Cleary coordinator. Why that is, is because there are requirements that say we need to protect public safety. So we need the information about what's happening to determine whether or not we need to send out a warning. Right? To the rest of the campus. So that's really one of the main reasons why that reporting has to happen. Okay, but if somebody does that, and that's good, you know, they're talking to a trusted faculty member or an advisor or something like that, that can kick off an investigation when they actually didn't mean to, because the university has an obligation to make sure that things are safe, Right, right? right? So what we're trying to tell everyone is to go see one of the confidential people. Um, including me, um, at the Women's Resource Center, and we are open to everybody. Everybody. We serve men, LGBTQ communities. Everyone is welcome in our center. Um, So come see me or or a counselor at Student Health and Counseling or CARS, which is the faculty staff counseling, Um, and we will, you know, tell you what all the options are for reporting. And then the victim, survivor, can make a decision about what they need to do, what's best for them. You know, the mere idea that, that probably thousands of people are, are actually having this kind of training or hearing these things, this is, this is to me a revolution. I mean, it seems unheard of. It's magnificent. Uh, and it would be wonderful if they got it every semester, if there was a way to normalize. You know, we were, uh, we've been covering police violence in Albuquerque mm-hmm. quite heavily on the Mercury. And when we hear over and over again, particularly in the Justice Department report of the, uh, report of the normalization of violence. And this, this seems to be a part of this, of this whole thing. So could you tell us a little bit about, i got to get the acronym uh, 
uh, down right, the SART program, the Sexual Assault Response Team, That's right. which seems to me to be a, a really a powerful intervention mm -hmm. tool to, uh, uh, to help people. So our Sexual Assault Response Team is really the team of people who can do something. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> um, cool. Right? This is where services are um, and the people can, who can hold people accountable are so sane um our our community partners are sane which is the sexual assault nurse examiner collaborative Great. um rape crisis center that provides advocacy and counseling Great. so those are our first level right that we want to connect people who experience sexual violence to because it's important to preserve any evidence possible it's in, and it's saying they can also get prophylactic medication against STIs, Great. pregnancy, Great. right, and get follow up care. Great. At rape crisis, they can um, access counseling, and their advocates can help them through the process as well. Okay, so the next level really is 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 more counseling. <laughs> so there's the Student Health and Counseling Center on campus for students. There's CARS, which is Counseling and Referral Services for staff and faculty. Um, there's, we have limited um, counseling at the Women's Resource Center. So as it's available, we provide it for free um, and that's open to everyone. Um, and then there's Manzanita Center that also offers counseling for free and is open to everyone. The Psychology Clinic, um, there are other resources. Mm -hmm. Th those aren't members of SART. Let me get back to, to that. Um, and then um, the next level is law enforcement. So if a victim chooses to report, um, we can help connect them to either UNMPD, who has five designated SART detectives at this point. Which is something. UNM. <laughs> UNM. Wow. Yes. Um, so that's great that we have that um, because these folks are trained. They have a lot of experience. Um, most of them worked in APD, uh, like sex crimes or child abuse or, or the family abuse and stalking team. Like So there's a lot of good experience around these issues in our police department on campus. So someone can choose to go to them to start a criminal investigation. Uh, and of course, we know that path. There's an investigation, they write it up, they send it to the district attorney's office who looks at it and decides whether or not they can win. Right? They can get a conviction. If there's not enough evidence, they won't pursue it. But that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yes. I want to be very clear about yes. that. Yes. Because in the criminal justice, the criminal system, um, they need beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a very high standard it is. Um, for evidence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's that possible path for someone. The other path, which has been very much in the news, um, is the campus administrative investigation. Hmm. Okay? Yeah. Sexual violence, there are prohibitions against sexual violence in policy at the institution. Uh -huh. So it's like your workplace policy, right. right? There are rules. If you break a rule, HR is going to investigate it, and you could be held accountable, right. regardless of whether it's a crime or in the criminal system, right? So the, our on-campus investigation, we have changed it. Um, it is now, the, the whole investigation is now handled by the Office of Equal Opportunity, who investigates civil rights violations civil rights violation. because sexual violence is a civil rights violation. Right. Exactly, under Title IX. Right. So the proper home for that and that investigation is at OEO. So they do the investigation. Their standard of evidence is called preponderance of the evidence. It's 51%. It's more likely than not that it occurred, that a violation of our policy occurred, right? right? It's very different. So two paths. <laughs> you can still be held, held accountable on, on either one of those paths, right? So even if somebody doesn't face charges criminally, they could still be expelled if they're found responsible yeah. on our campus for sexual violence. So that's sort of, that is 
Sartre. Our Sartre. It is transitioning this semester to SMART. So I know, I know, I know. <laughs> We've gone through several acronyms, yeah, yeah, but that's the good. one that make, that makes the most sense. So it is Sexual Misconduct and Assault Response Team because we have invited domestic violence services to the table and also um, APD, uh, Family Abuse and Stalking Team, because what we need to be responding to is the spectrum of sexual violence. So sexual exploitation, like revenge porn, right. is a huge problem. Um, and domestic and dating violence. Um, so we are, we're going to be able to handle all of those within SMART to provide the best services we can to our community. Could you tell us a little bit about Lobo Respect? Sure. I think that's a, it's an idea that, uh, uh, that seems like, like its time has come. Um, so, and I know this plays into this whole, this whole wonderful thing. I mean, I don't think I've ever had any idea that this was going on at UNM, and it's so necessary. And I know that it's going to get bigger and become more a part of the daily fabric of university life. Mm -hmm. And really, that's the only way this is going to get solved, is if this is there all the time. So the Sexual Violence uh, Prevention Task Force, the Presidential Task Force, came up with this overarching kind of theme um, called Lobo Respect to s encompass everything that we're trying to do around sexual violence. And we wanted to make it something that people would feel um, comfortable with interacting uh -huh. so you know we tossed around a lot of different ideas and and violence was in the title um but there's conversation across the country that because students uh because violence is so normalized especially sexual violence um that a lot of times people don't identify what happened to them as violence uh -huh. so we were trying to look at something that was positive, that was forward thinking, and we came up with Lobo Respect. So that is respond, educate, support, prevent, empower, consent, and train. Lobo Respect. And we liked it a lot because it does encompass all the sexual violence stuff, but we can bring lots of other things into this. Yeah, yeah. Hate bias, civility, um, integrity, all kinds of things all kinds of issues on campus can be encompassed in this this campaign. Um, so we put together a website. Again, very quickly, uh, we are we are moving at lightning speed for <laughs> academia. <laughs> um, we really are. Um, so we put together the website over the summer, and if you go to that website, loborespect.unm.edu, you'll see a couple of different sections: reporting, support education oh, and training and what UNM is doing, great. right? And it's all geared towards sexual violence right now, sexual violence prevention and response. But we broke it down. So if you click on report, there are options. So if you've just experienced sexual assault, click here. Domestic and dating violence, click here. Stalking, click here. Sex sexual exploitation, click here. And then there is a step-by-step -step of what to do. Wow who to report to, what, you know, what will happen, um, how to preserve evidence, and how to reach out for other resources. So we really tried to make sure that that was accessible and user-friendly. Um, and then people can also find out about upcoming trainings and educational efforts uh, that are going on on campus and figure out how to get involved if they, if they want to. They can also see our policies. Uh, there's a section on consent. Um, there's a section on uh, rights and responsibilities uh, for both victims and the accused. Um, so, and then tons of resources, health, counseling, advocacy, legal resources, the whole gamut. So it's all on there. Um, so that, that's kind of our baseline um, and, and will be like the place to go for that information. So that's, that's Lobo Respect. So we had cards printed um, over the summer, right before the start of the semester. So we got cards printed with a whole bunch of resources on the back. We got tattoos for, that, w that students passed out at tailgates at the football game. So people had Lobo Respect across their cheeks. Um, and so, you know, we're housing helped uh, residents' life and housing helped pay for the tattoos. Actually, they did pay for the tattoos. University Communications and the Women's Resource Center bought 
the, the Lobo respect cards because we haven't had extra resources for these efforts. Um, which, which is a challenge. Yeah, sure. Um, so cool. really everything from, from start smart has come out of the women's resource center, um, budget. Um, and then all of the, the additional stuff is sort of every people are chipping in, um, as we can. Um, and the only way we were able to train as many people as, as we did, uh, was we had volunteers to help us. So there was myself and um, three students from the Women's Resource Center doing training. And then a volunteer from Career Services showed up and said, hey, I want to help. Yeah. And then the Dean of Students came over and said, hey, I, I'll do some trainings. Yeah. And then uh, a colleague from the Rape Crisis Center, the male, the male involvement um, person there, Larry Enojos, came over and said, hey, I'll do some trainings. Yeah. So, you know, that was the only way we were able to reach as many people as we did. So we read unhappily that there's been an uptick in reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, or I guess that's really happily, I suppose, really, from 11 to from four to 11. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that that's not, that doesn't indicate an increase, although it's staggering as it is, but it, in, but it indicates an increase in reporting, am I right? About exactly, it? that's exactly right. Um, what it represents is, it is an increase in reporting. Right. Um, as we mentioned earlier, 90% of sexual assaults go unreported. <sighs> so it's not that UNM has a new problem. It's not that this is a new problem. Um, what this indicates to us is that we are doing a better job of advertising help yeah. <laughs> and what can be done. And we're, we're starting to change things um, around coming forward. Coming forward after a sexual assault is tough. Exactly. It can be, we're doing our best not to re-victimize, yeah. right? Yeah. But a lot of that happens with just individual people's responses sure. um, to, you know, c going back to the victim blaming. Um, and then the public response, right, the media response to somebody who comes forward is... Unbelievable. It so, so is bad. so frightening, um, and when we think about, you know, a, a lot of people will say, well, what about the false reports? You know, victims lie all the time. Women lie all the time about rape, which we could have a whole different discussion about, <laughs> but just shortly, which we should do, it's which important. we should do. Yeah. So happily, um, you know, the, the FBI, um, statistics on false report for sexual assault and rape are the exact same for any other crime. And that's two to eight percent. Oh my God. So when you think about that in terms of reading in in the media that somebody has come forward with a charge of, of sexual violence, sexual assault, I encourage people to remember that ninety two to ninety eight percent of the time that person's telling the truth. Yeah. Whether there's enough evidence to get any kind of justice yeah. is a different issue. Right. Because right, a lot right, of the right. because sexual violence, 85 percent of the time, sexual assault happens between people who know one another. It's not the stranger in the bushes, right. although that can happen. Yeah. But that's a minority of of yeah. cases. Yeah. This is happening between intimate partners, between friends, between people who are casually dating. Um, these are people who know one another. Often not a lot of evidence, like physical evidence or, you know, any other corroborating witnesses or anything like that. So, you know, it, it gets down to those instances of, of this person said and this person said. And then somebody who's investigating has to make a, what I think is a almost impossible judgment call yeah. um, on it. So... 92 to 98 percent of the time people who have reported a sexual assault are telling the truth and that is a huge cultural it's a reality that needs to overpower that huge cultural myth about oh women just lie because they regretted having sex so to kind of sort of wrap this up a little bit if we could and i hope you come back numbers of times uh <laughs> to uh Insight New Mexico and the Mercury Library. Um, uh, 
Much of this seems to have to do with the enculturation of males in our society and around the world. Mm -hmm. What can be done? What can be done at at an intervention at eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one in college mm -hmm. to um, to not overcome? I don't think you can overcome it, but to certainly ameliorate it and cause people to think and become rational and compassionate people before they actually do something that they know mm -hmm. they shouldn't do, or perhaps they need to know they shouldn't do. So, you know, you bring up a great point, the acculturation of, of boys and men, and I think really for us to have a big impact it needs to start way before college yes um but what you know where where we are where i am um that age group is is where we are and who we're dealing with and and they've had 18 years of <laughs> training on how to be a man yeah. in our culture um and of course that changes within um you know, different groups in our in our country, uh, but the overall message about masculinity at this moment in time is hyper masculinity, hype and violent masculinity. The, these are the God trends. Purpose. You know, there there are there are male activists out there like Jackson Katz and and academics like Michael Kimmel and um, folks like that who in in the field of men's studies who are really looking at at that construction of violent masculinity um, to start to deconstruct it yeah. and say, okay, well, what are the stories? What are the ramifications? And how can we kind of, you know, start to change this? Because, you know, when we're talking about sexual violence, historically it's been seen as a women's issue. No, no. <laughs> women aren't the ones the, doing the, it the <laughs> predominantly yeah, yeah. um so yeah it, it's a men's issue right it's all it's all of us yeah. it's an issue for all of us yeah. but one one thing that always sticks out in my mind is um jackson katz did a film with uh sat jolly at the media education foundation uh called tough guys and in it shows the evolution of gi joe the toy G.I. Joe wow. over time. Ooh. So in the beginning, it's kind of this mm, normal looking male figure, um, not particularly muscular, um, to this evolution of this big hulking, big gun, kind of like just over the top, yeah. right? Masculinity. And we see that too in images of, of male heroes, right? Mm -hmm. So... The idea of this super tough, uh, uncompromising, uh, dominant, tough, violent male power is kind of the overarching idea of masculinity uh, in our in our society and around the world in, in different yeah. aspects, especially as we export right our ideas yeah. of yeah. of that in the media. So, but it's really exciting to see some counter coming to this. A lot of men starting to look at it and go, that construction doesn't really fit me. Because, um, oh, hey, yeah. I want to be a stay-at-home dad. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, yeah. I want to be the primary caretaker yeah. for whatever reason of yeah. my children. Yeah. Um, I want to work in, in the movement to end violence against women. I want to talk about these things. We want to construct a, a better model of masculinity where men feel free to be in touch with all of their emotions, right? Aren't kept in this super tiny little box of just tough, no crying, no, you know, anything. And if... It, you know, to be stuck in that box means if you step out of it for any reason, there's a lot of forces that come and shove you back in, yeah. right? And they're usually derogatory names for women, <laughs> right? And violence yeah, yeah, yeah. to shove shove men yeah, back in this yes, box. Absolutely. So it's really about breaking free of that destructive concept of masculinity and creating a new, right, idea um, th where men are whole people, 
And women are whole people. (laughs) And we come together and we have beautiful, healthy relationships in whatever configuration works for us. (laughs) Um, And, you know, it's all based on respect and, and love and sharing and openness and wonderful things. So having those conversations with students at this particular moment is very exciting because this group of students, these the millennials, see some examples of different ways, Wonderful. I think. Oh, I and I think they're at least thinking about it on some level, right? And trying to separate, or at least think about it. So that's what we keep, we always want to encourage. But we also, you know, we need everybody, everybody talking about this. Absolutely talking about this issue and when you know and challenging victim blaming and challenging rape culture and challenging this notion of you know men have to be tough boys have to be tough all the time um so you know i really encourage people to talk with their sons with their daughters with their transgender children about healthy relationships and respect and consent I know talking about sex with, with your kids can be kind of really scary. <laughs> consent, 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 communication and respect, right? This has been a wonderful interview. I'm just, my heart's expanding. I feel so good about this. I, I hope this just charges on. I'm sure it will. And, and, um, if we can help you with the mercury in any way, please let us know. We'd love to have you back in the future. Thank you. I'd love to come back anytime.